My name is Gail A. Hansberry, Gail Adele Hansberry. I was born here in Washington. Uh, I'm a native Washingtonian. And I was born on Labor Day, the year I was born, which was three days before Germany marched into Poland, three days before the Second World War. So 1939. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so I wondered if we could talk about your family and maybe uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your grandparents, uh, where were they from, um, how far back does the family go in terms of being Washingtonians? Um, I was the only Washingtonian. My mother and father and grandparents were born in Mississippi. And uh, they moved to, or my mother's parents moved to Chicago when my mother was uh, about five. So my mother th always said that she was from Chicago because she grew up in Chicago. So she thought of herself as being from there. My father was born in uh, Gloucester, Mississippi, a small town, um, not too far from Louisiana, northern Louisiana. And, um, and his mother, I guess, was born in uh, Mississippi also. And um, so my mother and father met in Chicago. You didn't ask me that, but <laughs> that's where they met. And when did they move to Chicago, <coughs> Mississippi? Do you? Well, my mother, as I said, when she was five, roughly. But, but I meant what year would that have been, roughly? Mm, maybe that? around 1912, 1913. And um, my father didn't actually move to Chicago. Um, he grew up in Gloucester, Mississippi, went to school in Gloucester. Mm -hmm. Um, his father, I understand, was a history teacher at Alcorn College, and um, he died uh, suddenly when my father was small. And, uh, but uh, my father was always interested in history, and uh, he went to Alcorn uh, for a few years, well, I guess, um, um, to elementary school or to high school, to high school at Alcorn. And then he was interested in history, African history, and he learned about uh, African history. And there was a bibliography that W.E.B. Du Bois had suggested uh, be read. And so he couldn't, the books were not there at, Al at Alcorn. And then he went to Atlanta for a short while and the books weren't there all of the books that were listed, and so he went to Harvard and he read the books about Africa. So my father's passion was African history. Mm -hmm. And he ended up uh, going to Harvard? Yes, yes. So how did that come about? Well, I'm not, you know, I've heard of other people mm -hmm. just sort of showing up there and saying, here I am. Mm. I don't know if he did that. Uh, I know it was during the First World War. <laughs> um, and I don't know actually the procedure or the process that he went through to get there, but whether he said, here I am to read the books that, uh, that uh, are listed here on Africa. Yeah. But anyway. But he attended Harvard. He attended Harvard. And he was interested in history, but African, African history, African history, ancient African ancient history, African. which was a subject that most people didn't know about, didn't want to know about, mm -hmm. because at that point, most people said Africa had no history, it had no past. And um, my father was, I guess, there to say yes, mm -hmm. Africa did have a past. And especially since mankind originated in Africa, how can you say that the continent had no history, no past, when that's where yeah. human beings came from? Mm -hmm. So did he stay at Harvard? He graduated okay. in uh, 1921, I believe. Yes. And then? 
he started teaching at Howard in 1922 <laughs> and stayed there until he retired in 1959. So did he establish an African history program at Howard? Well, or was there yeah, one there already? no, no, there was no, no there program was no at Howard. Mm -hmm. And many people, many of his colleagues, I understand, were um, not very kind to him because many people, those who were educated, again, thought that there was no history, there was no past. And um, they were also concerned because he did not have a PhD. Well, he didn't have a PhD because nobody knew more than he did. He could not get one, mm -hmm. so the story goes. And um, so there was a certain, um, I don't know if you could say jealousy. Um, his classes were quite large, I understand, and um, well thought of. And my father was known as a very good teacher a mentor, he was considered uh, the unofficial father of African students at Howard. There were few, a few students who came, I guess, in the 1930s, 1940s, and uh, many of these people were from either Ethiopia or Nigeria, as I understand it. And I grew up knowing um, Ethiopians and Nigerians, and uh, they were brilliant. <laughs> I guess they had to be brilliant to get from their original countries to Howard back in the uh, 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and your mother then, so this is your father. My father. And your mother then came to Chicago. When she was five and or so. And that's where she did her schooling and... Yes, she grew up in Chicago. She went to the University of Chicago. And from what, from what I remember her saying she was the first black person in the uh, choir at the mm -hmm. University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And what did she study? French was her major. Mm -hmm. And so she got an undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. Then did she teach? Or? She did teach. Um, oh dear, it was in Tennessee. Um, was it Tennessee State? Where is, uh, oh dear. Doesn't matter. So she 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 finishes in Chicago and goes to goes Tennessee, Tennessee to teach. teach, but also. Um, and you think it was Tennessee State? I think so. Okay. I, I'm I'm I I'll have to double check mm -hmm. that. Sure. Um, but also, when she worked in Chicago, um, she worked as a social worker, and I don't know if she went on to get a degree in social work, but because I gather the jobs were um, very limited for black people. Um, social work was uh, something that was available. Teaching was available and social work was available. So she did social work as well in Chicago. In Chicago. Mm -hmm. Was it predominantly for uh, uh, black communities? Or I don't, you know. don't know. Mm -mm. Okay, I see. So when did, where did your parents meet? In Chicago. Oh, okay. My father um, was doing uh, research at the Oriental Institute, mm. and they met there. The one at the University of Chicago? Yes. Yes, that's yes. a very famous one. Mm -hmm. yeah, very mm -hmm. nice. And they met there, and um, th did they live there for a while? Um, uh, I guess shortly after they met, well, <laughs> they married. Yes. And uh, he spent a year at Oxford. So I, it was like their honeymoon was in Oxford, England. Yes. And, uh, uh -huh. and he continued his studies of Africa at Oxford. Well, just for the year, the year yes. because then the war broke out. Yes. And he came back to Howard. Mm. Um, although he got a master's degree from Harvard in 1932, I believe. And so he so he goes back. To he Harvard. goes to Harvard, um, yes, mm -hmm. for a master's, mm -hmm. and um, all of this was before he met my mother. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so he met my mother, I guess, in 1937, 1938, mm -hmm. and um, 
then goes to Oxford in 1938 and then mm -hmm. returned. Back to Howard. Yes, and, and I was so born in 39. And you were born, okay, I see. So he stayed at Howard? Yes. And they lived in Washington, Washington. for the rest of the time? Yes. yes. My first home was Howard University. It was mm -hmm. in Minor Hall mm -hmm. at Howard University, which has since been torn down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was it like for you growing up? It was very interesting. Um, I didn't realize how interesting it was until I grew up and found out what other people did or how they lived. So it was very normal for me to know about Africa, to know that mankind originated in Africa, to know that Africa is the richest continent in the world, to know that uh, Greek and Roman philosophy and so on uh, came out of Africa. Um, so I thought everybody, you know, knew the same thing. And uh, my father used to talk to me. <laughs> I would sit on the piano bench when uh, I don't know, five or six or seven years old, and lecture to me. Maybe he was practicing his lectures for his students. And um, so I just grow, grew up knowing about Africa, so I assumed everybody else did too. And the older I got, the more I realized that most people didn't know anything about the continent. And, um, you know, when you're young, you judge other people by yourself, even when you're old. <laughs> um, so. And so, uh, where was your schooling? Was there Here school? in Washington. But was it uh, near Howard? What was the school? Um, your elementary? No, I, uh, well, we moved, let's see, I said uh, my first home, home was Howard University. Then we moved to Northeast. Washington, and then, uh, well, far northeast, and then we moved to Brookland. So um, I remember going to Mott School, which was near Howard, but I only went there for a short time in kindergarten. And then um, I went to a school not far from my home in Brookland. It was called Crummel Annex at that time. And <laughs> uh, I must have gone there, um, oh, for the, my first, first grade, second grade, third grade or so. And then they built another school on that same spot and they called it Slow School, named for Lucy Diggs Slow, who was, uh, Dean of Women at Howard, mm. and so um, my the end of my elementary schooling was at Slow oh, School. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Oh, just a normal experience. Mm -hmm. Good school, you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was segregated, but you know, it was yeah, yeah just a normal mm -hmm. school. Teachers were all black. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then middle school or junior high, whatever it was called at that Junior time. high junior school high, was yeah. Banneker Junior High. Mm -hmm. And, and um, first year of high school was in Cairo, Egypt. Okay. So So you finished junior high in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go. To and junior high is also segregated. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Then what? In Egypt, which was 19. What makes, what, why do you go to Egypt? My father had a Fulbright research grant, so he was a Fulbright research scholar, mm -hmm. and the only place apparently that the Fulbright, um, that a Fulbright uh, fellowship was offered was in Africa, was in Egypt, mm. and so he went there. And the, uh, what year was this? 1953-54. So when we left New York, I was 13, when we arrived in Alexandria, I was 14. We went, um, the other Fulbright families uh, were sent over on a ship. So it took two weeks to get there. On the way over, the ship stopped in um, Barcelona, um, Marseille, 
and um, Naples. Mm. And so we yeah. went sightseeing in each of those three. So it was your father, you, your your mother, sibling, your mother, your and my sister. And your sister. Mm -hmm. okay. Your mm -hmm. sister is older or younger? Than younger. You? She's mm -hmm. uh, mm, seven, eight years younger than I. There was a middle sister who died when she was three and I was seven. Mm -hmm. And then Kay was born after that. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about Egypt. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was really the best year of my life. It was so different. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting being there because we were brown in a city, in a country of brown people. Um, but also I, I found out there were a lot of Greeks in, uh, in Cairo and other people in Lebanese and so on. So it was a very cosmopolitan city. But I was also intrigued um, by the donkeys and the camels that were in the streets along with the cars. And uh, I remember when we arrived, uh, we stayed at the Mina House Hotel in Giza, uh, just at the foot of the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to go horseback riding, or they offered horseback mm -hmm. riding. I mean, you just get on a horse and somebody <laughs> sure. would yes. lead you along. Yeah. And um, at that time, you know, uh, you would wear pants on a horse. Mm -hmm. And I would wear, we called them at that time, dungarees. Now they're called <laughs> jeans. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would go out in my jeans and I would get these funny stares. Here's this brown Egyptian looking woman wearing pants, which was very unusual. And, uh, but anyway, it was just wonderful. The pyramids were nice and we went up and into the pyramids and, um, and my sister and I went to an English school. Had we stayed there more than a year, she, my mother might have put us into a French school, but we went to Manor House English School in Zamalek, in the island in the, in the Nile. What was that like? That was interesting too. Well, it was all very interesting, <laughs> new and different. Um, boys, it was co-educational up until, um, I think, the. This, when the students were 12, boys and girls went up until they were 12. And then since I was in the 10th grade, it was all girls at that time. And um, so um, the um, classes of, court were, of course were taught in English, but there were three other non-Egyptian girls in the class and um, I think one from Australia and two from Britain or so. And uh, that was the time when a foreign language was started. Mm -hmm. And so we were the only ones who did not know French because the school itself taught, or the students uh, brought, were brought up learning French, English, and Arabic. Mm -hmm. So they were all fluent in all three languages by the 10th grade. And so they set up a special class for uh, the three, four non-Egyptians in the class mm -hmm. who did not speak mm -hmm. Arabic or French. So that's how I started mm -hmm. my French lessons in, uh, in 10th grade. But my sister was in first grade, and so she did mm -hmm. start uh, learning um, Arabic. Arabic. Mm -hmm. And, and was, what was that like to go to a whole different school in another country? Um, was it anything unusual for you or not? No, no, no it, it was, was just yeah. fine. You know, you're 14, um, it was like seeing the world. Mm -hmm. yes. And since I had already been aware of Africa, grew up with Africans, uh, it was just a natural progression of um, what I had grown up with. Um, but I knew that I was in a country that was primarily of color. Uh, although Washington was segregated, it didn't affect me that much because again, 
I knew what my background was, so I don't think I was as affected um, as many other people might have been. And again, I wasn't aware of how many people, black people, had been affected by segregation until I got much older. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? About? What's the di what was the difference? For, what was it that those who uh, were affected by segregation, what, what well, Can from, you just tell me what you mean by that? I guess um, many black people sort of didn't have a feeling of, um, well, had a feeling, I guess, of inferiority. Um, or they had a sense that they couldn't do certain things. But I wasn't aware that they had that feeling because I was not affected in that specific way. Um, I hear more and more people talking now about women, they have many more opportunities. But with the um, people that I went to school with, I remember um, Eleanor Holmes Norton was going to law school, Fisk, Fisk, uh, Chris Philpot was going to law school. So there were, and then um, there were, uh, contemporaries who were going to medical school. Um, so I didn't know that there were certain things that women weren't supposed to do or uh, were incapable of doing. And then as I grew older, I realized that women were really much more, um, were stronger than men, <laughs> especially emotionally, I found out. And uh, even physically, I mean, to have a child, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've never had a child, but I've uh, photographed the birth mm -hmm. of a baby. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the year in Egypt was really, like you described it, as the best year of your life. Yes, it was a completely yes. new and different uh, world. And the whole family loved it. Yes, oh yes. All of you. Mm -hmm. My mother and I went to the Holy Land and uh, mm -hmm. we could not fly over Israel at that time. Yeah, yeah. We had to detour. Right, right. <laughs> and so we were in Jerusalem for about, uh, I don't know, two, three, four days, mm -hmm. and then came back to, mm -hmm. um, to Cairo. Mm -hmm. And then while we were in Cairo, we took a couple of uh, trips up the Nile, or mm -hmm. down the Nile to Upper <laughs> Egypt. Yes, right. And um, mm -hmm. we went to Wadi Halfa in the Sudan. Mm -hmm and then came back. And then after that academic year was up, uh, my mother, sister, and I came back to Washington, and my father stayed in Africa and traveled throughout for a few months. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you came back to Washington, you were? Oh, yes, yes. yeah, I was uh, yeah. a year older. <laughs> right. I was 15. And while we were in Cairo, the board, uh, what is it, Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. Supreme Court uh, ruling had been mm -hmm. um, decided. And so Washington was immediately desegregated. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going to Dunbar High School, where I would have gone, um, I went to McKinley High School mm -hmm. because I was zoned for McKinley High School, which um, I guess I was in the, uh, first uh, desegregated class. Mm -hmm. I was in the 11th grade and in the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Again, nothing. Nothing unusual. Was nothing unusual. Um, it was a technical school, so um, from what I understand, the boys at Armstrong High School mm -hmm. uh, were also put into, attended um, McKinley. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was just, everybody got along fine, and so it was normal. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the teachers, you had both mixed uh, white and black? Primarily white, white. teachers, mm -hmm. but I remember the music teacher was black, mm -hmm. and um, most of the teachers were white, since it was the first year of uh, integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and so you finished high school? Yes. Uh, 
twelfth grade. Twelfth grade. And that was two years at McKinley. McKinley. Mm -hmm. um, and then did you go on to? I went to Howard. Howard yes. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Howard because I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to be where my father was, where he could keep an eye on me. But the whole four years there, I only came across or ran across him once on campus. And now, in retrospect, I'm very glad I went to Howard. And um, um, it was nice to live at home. I didn't have the dormitory experience that many people had, although I was an exchange student at Denison University for one semester in Granville, Ohio. So I had somewhat of a dormitory experience there. What was that like, the, going to Denison? Oh, that was fine too. Was interesting. Yeah, I guess they didn't have any black people or maybe one or two other black people, mm -hmm. but it didn't bother me. <laughs> so uh, it was just, again, natural, normal. Mm -hmm. And then so you came back to Howard, and what did you study? I studied art. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was always a visual person, I realized. Okay. And what aspect of art? That were you painting, drawing? Well, you took everything, mm -hmm. art history. Um, Mr. Porter, James Porter, was uh, the chairman of the art department, and he was uh, a painter and a historian. And Lois Maylou Jones uh, was well, a well-known painter there. And so I took history and um, the practical art, so to speak, studio art. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, continue that? Uh, I um, went to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture the year I graduated for that summer, learned fresco painting while I was there, and then uh, I came back and I went to Smith College for a master's degree. In art history? In art history, oh, yes. Nice. But I discovered Leonard Baskin and his, who was a well-known um, graphic artist and sculptor. And uh, there was a printing press in the art uh, building. Mm -hmm. And so I was much more interested in his courses in printing and graphics. So I learned etching while I was there uh, in his course. And I made a book of etchings, this little teeny book, mm -hmm. which I printed on a pearl treadle press and um, bound the book. So it was the first handmade book that I had made. I made three. <laughs> wow. the, the biggest was an edition of 17, but mm -hmm. the, this was a, an edition of uh, six or seven. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I was much more interested in doing mm -hmm. than yes. studying the historical yes. part. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you continue to have a studio? I mean, how did the art progress? Well, after, <laughs> After that, um, I came back to Washington. I worked at the National Gallery of Art in their publications department, and um, which was really fun. Mm. It was selling postcards, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in their, you know, uh, gift shop or where they sell things, mm -hmm. and that was lovely because. Uh, um, it had a lovely cafeteria, so you could go and get wonderful brownies on your break or eat lunch there. Yes. And uh, so I did that for almost a year. And I was told by some of the guards there that I was the first black person um, in a professional position at the Na at National Gallery. I don't know if that was actually true, but anyway, that's what I seem to remember. And then... Um, my mother uh, was teaching here uh, in Washington, and she came home from school one day, and she said, um, Taft Junior High School needs a teacher of art. And this was on a Friday. They needed it on a Monday. So I went. I, I had taken uh, education courses at Howard in the evenings when I was working at the National Gallery of Art. And so uh, I went um, to Taft Junior High School on Monday um, to teach art because the um, 
regular art teacher had to go out on maternity leave. Uh, in those days, if you started to show, mm -hmm. you had to leave, and then they had a um, substitute for a week. And I was the third teacher that they had had in the spring, <laughs> spring semester. And um, that was fine. That worked out well, too. I walked in and I looked at the students and they looked at me, the third teacher that they'd, they'd had. Mm -hmm. And um, so that turned out very well also. But at least I'd had the foundation mm -hmm. courses, but the foundation courses don't necessarily prepare you for actually sure. um, the classroom situation. But um, that was a good, a good uh, group of students and I did have um, um, a class of, um, I don't know, social adjustment students. It was a small class and I remember the um, assistant principal came up mm -hmm. to sit in on the class. I think there were maybe four boys and two girls and I didn't know why he was sitting in on the class. I guess he wondered if the students would have an issue, but they were fine. <laughs> But I also learned from teaching. I learned a lot from the students. And at that age, uh, how old was I? 23 or something. Um, the two girls in this class were lovely. They just wanted somebody to pay attention to them. And if you treated them nicely, treated them normally, they would do anything for you. So I had no problems with the girls, the two girls, or the three or four boys. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So how long did you do that for? Oh, just for that semester, that, semester. That, okay. that spring semester. And interestingly enough, my art teacher, the teacher that I had in uh, junior high school, um, was a colleague of mine. She was also teaching at Taft Junior High School right across the hall. and. Uh, her husband, Frank Snowden, um, was a colleague of my father's at Howard. Mm -hmm. And my father didn't drive, so they would go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Dr. Snowden would drive my father to and from Howard quite often. And Dr. Snowden was uh, a, a Greek and Roman person, a classicist, and my father was an Africanist. So I can imagine some mm -hmm. of the uh, discussions that they had. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But your father, uh must have become known nationally in academic circles. Somewhat, mm -hmm. somewhat. Um, he wasn't as well known uh, perhaps as he should have been, could have been. Um, he might have been equally uh, known internationally. Um, some of his students, um, well, one student was Dr. Zigwe, who became the president of Nigeria. And um, my father uh, and Horace Mann Bond started an organization called the African American Institute. And they had uh, uh, set up an Africa house where the students could come and mingle and had programs and so on. and. Um, I looked at pictures of in the scrapbook from that time, mm -hmm. and uh, in um, Nyeri from Tanzania, mm -hmm. I believe it was, uh, was here in Washington, and I saw a picture of him at Africa House, and um, um, Nkrumah also was took courses at Howard, but then ended up at uh, Lincoln, I believe it was. Uh, but my father always, um, I guess, instilled in the students uh, a sense of, um, I don't know, nationalism or, uh, because all of these countries were colonialized, yes. except for e yes. Ethiopia, mm -hmm. but they had their issues with the Italians. Mm -hmm. um, a sense of patriotism. Yes, yes. A sense, that's a good way of putting it, a, sense of, a right. sense of patriotism. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, uh, I would say that uh, my father's impartation 
of African history in a sense of nationalism gave rise to or helped these countries become independent. So help me understand, I, I, I've talked to a number of people about um, the presence of people from Africa, students from Africa at Howard. Mm -hmm. um, was that a common occurrence that people from, students from Africa would choose to come to Howard as opposed to other universities? Or was it because Howard was in Washington DC and the diplomatic core here mm. knew about Howard University? Do you have any? I don't any really comments? know, although what you're saying is uh, <laughs> plausible on all, on all fronts there. Because even now you're saying, you know, your father had these students who went back, became a president, and, and probably others who likewise were very accomplished in their countries. And I was mm -hmm. just curious about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so then... Uh, well, I guess yes. you, when, when some of these students came over, they had to be very bright. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, when they finished, they would go back and they would talk about their experiences, and then other students would come and Yes, and so on. kind of a chain... Migration. Yeah, I guess you could say that. And as I said, my father was the unofficial father of sure. African students, sure. most of whom were male, but there were a mm -hmm. few females sure. who came. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so you received a master's degree from Smith's College. What was Smith's College like for you? <laughs> it was just all women. <laughs> yeah. Um, how many? Uh, how many African Americans? Um, 13, mm -hmm. um, there were three, one, two, three, three African Americans in graduate school and maybe mm -hmm. 10 in undergraduate, mm -hmm. but there seemed to be a total of 13 mm -hmm. women of color okay, at the at school, school at that time. Okay. My sister went, um, what, eight years later, mm -hmm. and there were over a hundred <laughs> African Americans at that time. Mm -hmm. And again, was there any difficulties for you at Smith? Mm -mm. Dormitories, were you in dorms? Well, houses, uh, houses. Smith, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. well, they call them houses, yes. and some are literally houses, yes. and some are dorms. Mm -hmm. But no, um, the graduate house was a was a house, mm -hmm. um, and uh, each person I think roomed alone, so it was I not see. an issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when my sister went um, eight years later, there was no issue for her. Mm -hmm. And then after Smith, you again came back to Washington D.C. Well, yes, it was. I came back to Washington, and it was then that I took these courses in uh, um, education mm. at Howard. And then after that, I worked at the, the uh, school at the uh, yes at uh, the National Gallery mm. of Art. And then that summer, um, um, or that spring, taught at Taft Junior High School. Mm. And then I heard that there was a, an opening at North Carolina College to teach art history. So I went down there for three years. I went for one year, stayed three years, mm -hmm. and taught um, art history in the art department. North Carolina College. Which is now North Carolina Central University. University. And it's part of the university system. system. Mm -hmm. In Durham. Oh, Durham. Durham, the one in all. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yes, very nice. And uh, that you must summer. must have liked that. Because you went for a year and stayed three. Well, yeah, it worked out. <laughs> That's nice, yeah. Um, I uh, found out that just before going down there that summer, mm -hmm. Durham became desegregated. Mm -hmm. So it was just going from one desegregated, mm -hmm. you know, uh, experience into really another. Mm -hmm. So. Everything just yeah. kind of opened yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And were most of the students there, uh, was it a pretty mixed? They were all black. 
primarily all black. Okay. Yeah, maybe one or two, okay. or very few. Yes. Uh, interestingly enough, there were several um, teachers who were not black, mm -hmm. and I later found out that some of them were uh, from Europe, sort of refugees who came mm -hmm. over and who found uh, work at black colleges, and so there were one or two that were there. So what happened after that? I um, went to New York. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was interested in bookmaking, and um, I went to New York. Bookmaking, you need to describe bookmaking to people who might not know what that means. I know it's making yeah. a book, but what, it, what does it involve? <laughs> Well, it involves, um, I should have brought a little book that I did make. It was called The Book of Insects. And when I was at Smith and taking Mr. Baskin's uh, graphics course, I found little uh, plates, etching plates, um, zinc plates, uh, two inches by two inches. And I thought of what can I put on these little plates? And so I thought of insects. Now, I didn't know anything about insects, didn't particularly like them, but they were okay. And so I did the etchings of insects uh, at Smith, and I printed them on paper on the Pearl Treadle Press, and then I actually bound the book by hand. So um, I was interested in bookmaking um, at Smith, and then I went to New York to learn more about bookmaking. But then I found out you don't make, books are not made that way by hand. They're commercially made and much, just very different. And so um, I found out that I was not interested in commercially made books. And, but while I was there, I found a workshop while I was there in New York, um, I found a workshop, the AIGA workshop, uh, where you could go and make books by hand. So again, I set the type, you set each letter, and you print it, and um, run it through the press. And um, I also found the Bob Blackburn printmaking workshop. Um, where uh, the artists would go and do prints. I mean, they would etch or do lithographs. And uh, so that was very nice. I went down there and I would uh, print the etchings of insects that I had done at Smith. I would print down there. And then um, the um, haiku, I discovered haiku and there were haiku um, that fit several of the insects that I had uh, etched. <laughs> and so I um, printed the handset uh, haiku, and I printed it at the AIGA workshop, and then I went to the Bob Blackburn studio and uh, uh, printed the etchings and made uh, a larger edition called insects and haiku, and I made an edition of 17. At this time, I was working at Time Life Books as a researcher, um, and um, I would go up on my lunch hours to a uh, bookbinding workshop, and I would bind the books, and as I said, an edition of 17. So, uh, <laughs> Time Life. Yeah. Did you apply for that job, or how did you come by and where is that? Um, I think I heard um, many of these corporations were looking for minorities and women, and there were people who would, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, recruiters, recruiters uh, yes. or so. What year is this now? Um, are, we, are we in the 70s? No, we're in 1966 when 66, I went to New okay. to New York, mm -hmm. and uh, I stayed at uh, Time Life Books from 
56 to 76, roughly. And then I um, uh, stayed and did sort of freelance um, um, research and photography. I did a few photography assignments. And then um, my mother was ill in 1980, and then I came back to Washington. But in the meantime, um, I, I ran into another artist who said he was contracted by the U.S. Department of State, as in, we were called at that time, escort officers, who would travel with international visitors around the United States. And the State Department had a um, sort of citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy. It was called the International Visitor Program. And so um, from him, I learned about this program when I got back to Washington because of the illness and passing of my mother. I went, I applied, and then for the next 28 years traveled around the U.S. with international visitors from all over the world. The, yeah. And this was through which agency? U.S. Department of State. State. Oh, so mm -hmm. it was the Department of State. Mm -hmm. We were so contracted. You everywhere in the States. In the States. All 50 states mm -hmm. I've been to. And, and what would you do? During well, really, mm -hmm. we would just mm -hmm. sort of facilitate, make sure that they would uh, mm -hmm the visitors would get to their appointments on time or help them go to the bank or um, mm. <laughs> if they wanted to go to the zoo, go to the <laughs> zoo with them or whatever, sure, you know, sure. just sort of, yes. as somebody said to me, oh, you mean you babysat adults? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I guess you could say <laughs> that. Yes, yes sure. you just sort of yeah. did whatever was necessary. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this was, I guess, funded by U.S. Department of State, but then it was uh, administered by USIA, United mm -hmm. States Information Agency, mm -hmm. until it went back into the uh, Department mm -hmm. of State many years later. Mm -hmm. um, and there were um, groups of visitors, uh, multi-regional groups mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't know, 10 or more, mm -hmm. I think uh, I, some of the larger groups would be up to 25, and then you would have three or four, maybe five escorts. Uh, you would have regional groups, people from the same region or the same country. I escorted um, two groups, one group of Nigerian women, another group of women from Malawi, um, and then there was a group um, of women from all over, but they were interested in business. Mm. And I remember several women from Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, as, uh, so you, the, yes. the groups would be in any area, right. education, medicine, yes. whatever, yes. agriculture. <laughs> so I learned a lot about many different things. Were they from every continent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every co Europe. Europe, Africa, Australia, Asia, yes. Australasia, all of them. Amazing. New Zealand. Amazing. I so remember. You met a lot of people from a lot of places. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exciting. Not from Antarctica, but <laughs> everywhere else. Amazing. It was interesting, uh, some of the um, several groups were art groups, mm. and I escorted several artists, individual artists from uh, South Africa. Mm. And. Um, but all, all types of people yeah. from everywhere went to several pig farms, which was interesting. <laughs> I'd never been to a pig farm before. And uh, yeah. never um, gone horseback riding in Rocky Mountain National Park. Oh. And the groups or individuals would uh, go to the Grand Canyon, went there five times. And so you would have to go horseback riding as well? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's nice because you started on horses early on. <laughs> um, yeah, that was an environmental group, and I remember mm. there was um, oh, one person from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. He didn't go horseback riding, he went mountain climbing or so. Mm -hmm. But that was a very interesting um, 
trip. We went to uh, Alaska, Valdez, uh, that was at the time of the oil spill, mm -hmm. so the operation center of the Alaskan pipeline. Uh, and, uh, so you did that for how many years? 28, oh, as a contractor. Amazing. So you never knew when you would be working. Right, right. And so I would be traveling roughly about half of the year. Mm -hmm. The trips would range from um, four weeks to uh, four weeks if it was a large group or an individual uh, to uh, maybe um, five or ten days if it was a, with a, well if it was with people who were called voluntary visitors they would pay part of their way here and it was a shorter trip. So, How exciting. Yeah, <laughs> so as I mature mm -hmm. or uh, uh, become more seasoned, I realized that I had a really atypical life. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, yes. so it was just very interesting. It was very interesting to see the Israelis and the Palestinians in the, one of these group trips mm -hmm. or... Um, together? Or, together, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it was a multi-regional group. Mm -hmm. I don't remember which specific group it was now. It could have been the environmental group. But they got along very well. I mean, you put people in situations and they find out that they have commonalities, so. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. Very nice. So, um, the, uh, let's see, so your, and your sister, what, <clears throat> did your sister stay in Washington, D.C.? Well, my sister, um, she finished Smith uh, in 1969, and uh, she went to New York um, and worked uh, in publishing mm. for a few years. Was then, she, what did she study? Uh, sociology. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, well, sociology and religion and uh, mm. something else mm -hmm. uh, related. Maybe it was history. But she, she was a writer. You said she went to New York to publishing? Or oh, she worked in publishing, publishing as an assistant or so. Okay. Uh, a copywriter, she, she was in advertising for a while, so she would write the copy that would go oh, along with yes. <laughs> advertise, yes. yeah, advertising copy. Yes. And also she uh, uh, worked at a couple of publishing houses. Mm -hmm. And then she, after about five years, she returned to Washington, and she's been here ever since. And it was after that time that um, I started traveling, mm -hmm. contracted by the Department of State. Um, I just wondered, is there anything you'd like to say about um, your cousin, the playwright? Oh. <laughs> um, Lorraine Hansberry. You know, I didn't really know her very well. Um, she was 10 years older than I, maybe nine years older. She grew up in Chicago. Her father and my father were close. They were brothers. So her interest in Africa, I believe, came from my father. Um, I saw her a few times in New York, but then she died. Very young. Very young. Yes, literally before I actually lived in New York. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know her mm -hmm. that well. Mm -hmm. But it must have been exciting to have a cousin that accomplished as much as she did. Oh, yes. Um, we went to several openings in New York after of the, of the play, Ra um, Raisin A Raisin in the Sun. In the sun. Yes. Uh, we didn't go to the, the very first. Yes. But um, uh, we went to several. The last one was with Denzel Washington in mm -hmm. 20, what was that, 2012 really, uh, or so, uh, 2014, yes, something like exactly, that. We yeah. did go there. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, and uh, in, in ba basically, I mean, you've, you are a native of Washington, mm -hmm. so you must have seen a lot of changes in the city. Do you care to talk about that? <laughs> well, the, what, ch what change 
stands out most is the the um, the downtown area. I mean, old stores that were there are no longer there. Theaters, movie theaters that were there are no longer there. Um, five and dime stores, Nicers is no longer there. Um, so it's just the architecture of downtown Washington has changed. Um, and then also um, where we live, um, well, where I live now, my sister and I, um, when we moved there in 1965, the Upper Northwest was primarily white, and the people on the block across the street from us were white. And then we saw the gradual changeover to blacks moving in um, throughout Washington. Then it became Chocolate City, as it was called. And now we find out that white people are <laughs> moving back. Uh, so it's an interesting changeover again. But more and more apartments are being built now. And um, mm -hmm. it's no longer considered Chocolate City. Is there anything you'd like to tell the younger generation of African Americans? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would tell African Americans anything in particular, but I would just tell younger people. And, and this, um, I was asked, uh, or I thought of this several years ago at a Howard University uh, reunion. I just said, um, be curious. I guess I've always been curious. Be adventurous. And um, do the best you can. Um, and because I didn't know that there were certain things I wasn't supposed to do, I just went and I did them. So don't let somebody else stop you particularly since you know that you are descended from the first people on earth. So you were the ones who were here first. Nobody should stop you. And uh, who was it Martin Luther King said? I believe it, it was uh, Martin Luther King. Don't walk stooped over because nobody can get on your back. Stand up straight and do the best you can. So if you know your history, you can soar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I know you brought some photographs today. And uh, we'll, we'll look at them in a minute. But mm -hmm. is photography something that you got interested in? Or can you tell us a little bit about oh. <laughs> I I've always been a visual person, I realize. Mm -hmm. and. Um, when I was in my preteens, I was interested in astronomy. I thought I would be an astronomer and or a football player. <laughs> I was very interested in football. And um, well, I realized that neither of those two <laughs> professions was something that was uh, fit for me. Um, but I used to take star trails, open the camera, time lapse, and you could see the stars as the Earth rotated. And um, I would take them, take the film at that time to the drugstore to have it uh, processed. And they say, we, we don't, there's nothing on this film. And I said, yes, it is. Process it. The only thing you see are these white lines. Right. And, um, so I was always visual, and uh, I took pictures, snapshots throughout uh, traveling uh, to Europe, in Egypt, uh, the Middle East, um, Haiti. I went to Haiti once with a journalist. Uh, he was writing for a Methodist uh, organization, and I took the pictures. Um, and so um, I've just taken a lot of photographs. I'm an intuitive photographer. I'm not a technician. When I started, um, everything was on film. <laughs> um, 
now everything is digital, so yes. yeah. So I'm still learning how to, mm -hmm. but I still see things nice. constantly. Mm -hmm. So you went to Haiti? Yeah. When was that? Mm. It was just after uh, Papa Doc. Mm -hmm. When was that? I think it was in the um, 70s. What was that like? Oh, very interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Again, very normal, natural. Um, I was intrigued, however. Um, we went to a school to photograph. Uh, he was doing, the journalist was doing a piece, I guess, on the school. And uh, we had to um, drive in a Jeep for 45 minutes up to wherever the school was, and then we had to walk another mm -hmm. distance. And that, I don't know why, it made an impression on me because it was the first time that I had had to, uh, I don't know, been that far out, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, and you would see people walking. There was a lady, um, I have a photograph of her, uh, with the basket on her head, and she was walking into town. It would take her three hours to go to town, and then three hours to come back to town. So that made an impression on me. Um, although in, in Cairo, mm -hmm. you would see in the villages uh, nearby the women walking with their sandals on their heads. Mm -hmm. They would be walking barefoot <laughs> with the sandals on their heads. Um, but. I just saw the grace in the women. They could carry baskets of things, trees on their heads, and they were very erect and very stately. Whether it was Egypt or anywhere else in Africa or Haiti, yeah. Did you get over to other parts of Africa? Yes, I've been, um, what, to 13 different countries. I went um, with Lois Jones, who was my art teacher, mm. Lois Jones Pierre Noel. Her husband actually was from Haiti, uh, was from Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I went on one trip through Africa with her. She took her students uh, to about 10 different countries in Africa mm -hmm. to visit artists mm -hmm. in these countries. And then um, um, I went, uh, I was married at one time, so my husband and I uh, visited um, Ghana because he, at that time, was very interested in moving to Ghana eventually. And uh, so um, I've traveled to about uh, 10 or 12 different uh, countries okay. on three of different trips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> I can't think of it at the moment. Probably after the fact, yeah, I'll think of all sorts of things. But just, uh, I think if people knew their history. Mm -hmm. um, In other words, get to, to, so. For young people to get to know where they came from, who they are, is this what you mean by getting to know? Them? Yes, um, yes, particularly African American African people, Americans, yes. because yes. Uh, I know mm. I can't keep up with what's going on these days. Mm. Being woke or yeah. understanding <laughs> CRT, which apparently is something that's taught in. Um, critical race theory, which is taught in, in yes. law school, and they're talking about it in elementary yes. school. I, you yes. know, these are all yeah. new to yeah. me. But you seem to know a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of just teaching mm. the facts, um, mm. and as I said, I, I didn't know how many African Americans felt the way they did, or this sense of this supposed inferiority that they had, because I didn't feel that same sense of inferiority. It wasn't to say that I didn't have some insecurities along the way about something just in the process of growing up, but 
for people to think that they can't do something because they're a woman, because I didn't know I couldn't do anything <laughs> because I was a woman, uh, or because you were black, you know. We were the first people in the world. So know your history. Mm -hmm. that's Particularly for African Especially Americans, yes. yes. I, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's really mm -hmm. And the people who seemingly are putting down mm -hmm. African Americans, they feel less than. So if you bully somebody, it means that you don't feel good about yourself. If you feel good about yourself, you will try to elevate everybody else. Mm 